So thanks everybody from uh, Army. We're thanking you for joining us on another great topic this evening, uh, why you need ultrasound for successful regenerative medicine practice. Uh, I'm Todd Loma, the president of clinical education for the Advanced Regenerative Medicine, Medicine Institute, and I'll be moderating this session. Uh, we have people from all over the world together this evening, and it's a great pleasure to have George, Dr. George Chen Chang here to present on so much topic. Uh, Dr. Chen Cheng Chang specializes in musculoskeletal medicine and comprehensive pain management and was trained in physical medicine and rehab at Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago and Northwestern University. And he completed his fellowship training in comprehensive pain medicine at the prestigious Cleveland Clinic and Anesthesiology Institute. Uh, he's authored over 120 manuscripts on the diagnosis and treatment of pain pain and muscular skeleton conditions and has active research in regenerative medicine applications for chronic pain, medical aesthetics, and musculoskeletal medicine. Before we get started, I encourage you to send some questions in as soon as you can. Have them in the Q&A section. Dr. Chen Chang will address as many as possible at the end of this presentation. And with that said, it's a great pleasure to turn things over to Dr. George Chang Chang. All right, thank you guys so much. Um, thank you for taking the time to join me today. Uh, I recognize that the title of this talk is a little awkward, um, but you'll get a feel for what we're doing in a second. I'm gonna share my screen now. And let me know, you guys see that. Or... There we're we good. go. We good? There's some wild looking uh, music or something on the right hand side. Yeah. Or something there. No problem. Okay, so, um, you know, we kind of played with a couple of different titles for this, but uh, hopefully you'll appreciate it. I, I'm going to make a case today for why, if you want to really do well with your general medicine, you, you, I think it's really important to get facile with ultrasound. And so uh, let's just get going. So uh, a little bit about myself. I am over in Ventura County and I'm the director of pain medicine and I was the director for physical medicine rehabilitation for a while. Uh, I also have a private practice where I just practice um, what probably a lot of people would call concierge medicine, uh, but it's regenerative medicine, it's cash based. I see some professional athletes, I see some movie stars, um, I see regular people off the street, um, but it's a very different kind of practice where you know, we, we don't, it's not a volume game we're, we're trying to see low number of patients and, um, and really help them figure out a lot of things that conventional medicine hasn't been able to help them with. And so my goals for this talk are for you to appreciate the need to develop, develop sonographic skills. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it, but we're going to review ultrasound tissues and uh, give some examples of treatment. And uh, we had specific requests for me to go over bone marrow aspiration, ultrasound versus fluoroscopy, and also to throw in some things for some podiatry people who are interested in this talk as well, related to the foot and ankle. So, you know, a lot of people who have been doing pain medicine for a long time will say, you know, why do I need ultrasound when I already have fluoroscopy? And I think uh, when you're used fluoroscopy for, for many years, you develop what I call fluoroscopic eyes. And all you see are the bony structures. I um, mean, I think that's really um, misleading because then your differential becomes, you know, what's in the bone. Um, and you you forget that there's all these other things that could hurt uh, beyond the skin, the muscle, uh, the fascia, the, mu the tendons, the ligaments, et cetera. So there's also a case for dual modality. Um, and if you have, if you're training both of them, you know, they each of them is going to have uh, advantages and disadvantages. Um, and there are going to definitely be instances where ultrasound is clearly advantageous for fluoroscopy, even in light of common practice. Um, the ultrasound guidance now can be used to guide surgical procedures and even avoid open surgery. There's a study that came out of Boston recently where they looked at um, ultrasound guided carpal tunnel release versus open release, and they were having uh, equal efficacy. You know, and the other thing is that because each one of these modalities has their own pros and cons, it is very possible if, you, if you're fast on both of them, you should just combine them, right? You should have that um, and use them both to really guide uh, your procedures. So the, here's the thing, though. This is a talk on regenerative medicine. And what's the evidence base for regenerative therapies, right? 
uh, despite everybody's excitement about treating everything in the spine, um, most of the evidence out there, the good evidence, the, the you know, the level one studies, the RCTs, it's really in treatment of things in the peripheral musculoskeletal system. And what that means is that, you know, we're talking about tissues, um, uh, muscles, tendons, ligaments, et cetera. What I also want you to think about when you're approaching this and when you want to incorporate things for practice is I want people to try to move away from thinking about generalized structures, meaning, you know, I'll get a question that says, hey, Dr. Chang Chen, how do I treat someone's knee OA or how do I treat their knee or their shoulder? And what I really want you to think about is really think about the tissue types. And so how do you address the tendon issue, the supraspinaeus tear, or the ligament tear, the, et cetera, um, and think in, in these terms, okay? So I'm going to start off with the case presentation, and we'll we'll revisit this during the, the course or during this, this webinar. But this 45-year-old male, and he's got a chief complaint of medial knee pain. No history of trauma, played some football in high school and college, uh, now construction worker, BMI is 35, pain is worth a standing, kneeling, and walking, right? He takes NSAIDs and Tylenol, quote unquote, like candy. Had a single cortical steroid injection by the primary care divider, provider, which lasted six months, repeat lasted four months, right? On exam, they said, oh, you know, I've got this medial joint line, or they have medial joint line tenderness, pain with deep knee flexion, there's no crepitus, no fusion. So these are like bread and butter cases, right? This looks, smells, breathes, um, it sounds like, you know, classic um, knee osteoarthritis, right? But you get a knee x-ray. And this is considered, you know, the standard care for a lot of insurance carriers for you to even move forward and for you to identify what this is. And so you get a knee x-ray and what happens? So you see something like this. And the reality is that it might not be exactly like this, but in this young person, um, it could be just as pristine as this. And so this is sort of, you know, my, my, my point in throwing this out there is for you to un understand that, you know, x-ray is useful for certain things. And again, even diagnostically, x-ray is useful for certain things. Um, and we'll kind of discuss what that's about. So people are very familiar with the Kale grading system. And this is used uh, so that when we put people into studies or when we're trying to determine, you know, who's going to be a good surgical candidate, how do we determine that? And the reality is that a lot of our patients that start to have degenerative changes in their knees are going to be grade one, right? Essentially, they're going to look like they have almost pristine knees, but they look, breathe, and smell, taste, if you will, just like medial joint line pain. And it looks like they have early degenerative changes in their knee. The thing is that we won't develop these sclerotic changes, these joint line, um, uh, excuse me, narrowing and things of that nature until you've actually uh, pro progressed beyond that point. So what is an x-ray really good for? You know, an x-ray is good if you're looking for alignment. If you want to look at gross morphology, if you want to look at uh, joint space visualization, um, if you're looking for osteophytes, loose bodies, form bodies, et cetera, um, they're great and they're quick and they're not labor intensive, right? If you have it in the office, you can send someone down the hall, get an x-ray and you can be looking at it within 10, 15 minutes. You can look at some gross tissue changes. You know, you can identify if there's fluid edema um, and if there's things growing out of the bone. Um, and you can even see, you know, um, uh, like a, an effusion. Um, but x-ray is not going to really be good at identifying the soft tissue structures, right? And so in most places of the world, it's really just used as a first screening tool. So coming back to our patient, right? Despite the useful use of the radiology report, which if you saw earlier, it said, hey, it's normal. Um, you know, you do your own exam, right? You offer the patient regenerative medicine therapy and you place or someone places six to eight milliliters of leukocyte rich PRP into the joint fluoroscopic or palpation guidance. And eight weeks later, they say, hey, it's 40% improved in their pain. 16 weeks later, they say, hey, you know what, dog, I'm back to baseline. And this may or may not be your experience. So the question is, what happened? Um, and so what most people do when they're treating a knee is that they'll do a quote unquote, simple intraarticular knee injection. And that sort of works, but it doesn't really, really address the, the, the issues that might be going on this, with this patient. So what happens when you inject into the joint? Well, it's going to flood the synovium. It's going to flood the synovium inside the joint cavity, and it can act on the intraarticular structures, but your injection did not actually target any of them in particular. And this is a very important point because many things 
can hurt in the knee. An x-ray, again, is only best at identifying the bony structures. The soft tissues, the menisci, the ligaments, the muscular attachments are all going to precede gross abnormalities in the bone. And I'm going to make a case for this in a second so that you understand what we're talking about. This right here is the synovium. And the synovium, this, this bluish bag here, um, is, you know, people think of the synovium as this, like, um, sort of just like a fluid-filled sack. And they, you know, and you'll you'll talk to some orthopedic docs who they say, well, you have bursitis or whatnot, and they'll go and they'll do a cleanup. Literally, they'll scrape it away or they'll pull it out. They'll literally cut it out, do a, um, uh, an ectomy, if you will, right? And the thing is that I think it's, it's common for us to do these things where we don't really recognize how complex these structures are and how important they are. So the there's a nature to say, well, it's inflamed or whatnot. Let's just go and rip it out. The reality is, is that it's not just this bag. Okay. It's not just the sack that holds fluid or uh, it, just to, to reduce friction within a joint. And you have bursts burst all over the body. They're, they're there to reduce friction between muscles, between tendons, between tendons and bone, et cetera. The reality is that the synovium is actually very complex and the synovium is biologically active. There's the outside the synovium, there's inside the synovium, and there's a lot going on in there. I'm not going to belabor this and I'm not going to go through it too much, but if you really look into it, um, the synovium, which creates the synovial fluid, and you'll see that in patients that have a lot of fluid in their knees, um, has a lot of biologically active things going on. One of the things that create that causes that is that when you have cartilage breakdown in your joint, at some point, because the joint itself is trying to protect itself, it does produce that fluid. At some point, though, when you have so much of it, it actually creates a feed forward mechanism that actually uh, amplifies the inflammation in that joint. It amplifies it. And then that's why when you pull out the fluid, the body creates more and more fluid. And then we will do a therapeutic aspiration. Patients will feel better because it releases the pressure, but eventually it comes back. So very quickly, we talked about that patient earlier and he's got medial knee pain, right? And so I think it's important to recognize what are the other things that are there? Did you do a good exam? Not just not a physical exam, obviously, but also an exam possibly under ultrasound, right? And, you know, the MCL can hurt, the medial menisci can hurt. Is it more anterior? Is it the pes answering? Um, is the medial patellofemoral ligament? Do they have uh, appropriate tracking with the patella within the groove? And so if you look at these images here, and I don't know if my mouse shows up, but uh, here's an MR looking at this, right? And so we have, it, within here, we have the cartilage that overlies the ends of the condyles, right? The tibial plateau and the femoral condyles. And the cartilage is obviously is attached to that bone. Between them, we have the medial and lateral menisci. The menisci are like doorstops. They're circular in shape, sort of like donut shaped. But um, you can imagine it's sort of like a wedge to separate the femur and the tibia. When we talk about patients having joint, uh, bone on bone uh, joint disease, the reality is that in a knee, you have to have displacement of that menisci such that the two ends can make contact, okay? And you'll see in these MRs, um, I don't know if you, if you guys can, again, I don't know if you guys can see my arrows, but I, I kind of put them- We can see it, Dr. Chen, Chen. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. So you'll see that, you know, for this to make contact on these two ends, this thing that's sort of shaped like a triangle here has to be extruded out. It has to be pushed out. Um, this is the lateral side, here's the medial side, but they have to be pulled away such that you're making contact on the two ends, okay? This is what a medial meniscus looks like under ultrasound. This is, on the left-hand side is our, our um, uh, distal femur, the femoral condyle. This triangular shape here is a nice, uh, what they call a salt and pepper shake, a salt and pepper uh, look to the meniscus. Um, and this black area right here is um, the articular cartilage on the two ends. Overlying this, we have the MCL. There's two layers of the MCL. And you'll notice for the most part, this looks pretty darn good. There's the alignment where you, you'll notice the edge of the M, uh, excuse me, the edge of the meniscus essentially lines up with the edge of the femur and it lines up with the edge of the tibia. Okay. Again, we can easily identify this because um, it's very superficial. You, most ultrasound machines can pick it up, but you'll see that before you can make contact between this end and this end, and even the cartilage to make contact, really like this has to push out. And that's just called an extruded meniscus. 
Those structures we have are the MCL. The MCL has two layers, has a bursa within it. And again, that meniscus acts as a physical barrier that cups the femoral condyle and separates the two ends, right? And so you can see in this image here on the top right, this menisci, which is outlined in this dotted line, has started to move away from that. It's moving past, oops, excuse me. It's moving past that femur, right? It's moving past that tibia. And then you can see, you can imagine where these two lines intersect down here where my arrow's pointing, where you're gonna start making contact. The reality is that if we took this patient with this knee and got an X-ray, standing X-ray film, it's gonna look probably pristine, okay? It's nothing's gonna show up. Um, but again, there's other things we can look at here in our ultrasound. We can look at the MCL. We can look at the attachment points of the menisci to the uh, femur, the meniscal femoral ligaments, the meniscal tibial ligaments, et cetera. Okay. Again, this is just another diagram uh, demonstrating this. And you'll see that once you have that extrusion, you also start to create tension on that MCL. That's what this yellow line represents. And so that MCL can be stretched and create other issues as well. Now, think of this. Um, if you imagine a patient that has um, excessive valgus stress, right? Um, and so that valgus stress creates tension on that MCL, and then they're going to have even more of that, where it literally is, because it's attached to the meniscus, it's literally pulling out on it, okay? So I'm not going to go through the entire knee, but I just want you to appreciate the differential for all the things that can happen here, right? So we, this is the LCL, or excuse me, the lateral knee, and there's a lot of structures here, right? You can have the LCL, which is the first thing that people think of. Um, but there's also a little bit more posterior, the biceps femoris tendon, right? You have the lateral meniscus, you have the IT band, which can be uh, have issues in multiple sites. And you can have the popliteus, which attaches here and also it creates posterior knee pain. And so what are we looking at here? Okay, I just want people to appreciate this because people have a hard time even on ultrasound if you're not really familiar with these structures. So on this left-hand side, we have the IT band that goes all the way up to essentially the iliac crest, the lateral iliac crest. And, you know, you can trace this all the way down to Gertie's tubercle in the anterior portion of the knee. LCL, lateral collateral ligament, is really quite short, and it only extends from the distal femur, lateral, the lateral condyle, to the lateral um, portion of the fibula. Whereas the biceps femoris insertion tendon inserts on the posterior lateral aspect of uh, the fibula, very nearby to the LCL, um, and it actually surrounds the LCL. And so it's just to have an appreciation for all the structures that can create um, pain in this area. And so these two arrows on the right side, the red arrow is supposed to be the IT band and the aqua green arrow is supposed to represent the orientation of um, the biceps femoris tendon. And so my point is that when a patient comes in and they have knee pain, it's not a simple intraarticular injection for every patient. Because if it's a one size fits all and your results are very poor, obviously um, there, there should be an issue there, right? So if you have medial knee pain, what's your what's your diagnosis? What's your treatment? And if you're lateral knee pain, posterior knee pain, et cetera. So the same thing plays through. Very quickly, just to finish this up regarding the LCL, there's the LCL on the top. It's a normal structure. On the bottom side, you notice it's lost its normal fibular structure. It has some edema in it. And we'll go through and talk a little bit about what these structures um, look like if you're not familiar with ultrasounds and uh, imaging. Um, this is the LCL. It's very short. It just comes across from the, um, again, short distance. We have here the IT band that's gonna go all the way down. You can trace this up. That's one way to help identify it is just to um, trace the one that literally runs up the side of the thigh. Um, and here's the biceps femoris. And you'll notice that there's this uh, dark area in between. You have to recognize that that's not anisotropy, um, but it's actually the directional fibers of the LCL that are bisecting the biceps femoris insertion, okay? These are all these little tricks and nuances that you have to familiarize yourself to recognize what's normal and then what's abnormal, and then to also um, make an accurate diagnosis and then provide your injectate to the appropriate place. Let's see, what is this? Surprise video. Okay. Um, this is an interesting case. This was a guy who was a, uh, came to see me, he was about 35 years old, and he was a former a competitive Taekwondo guy. And he said at an early age, probably in his uh, early 20s, he got kicked really hard in the side of the thigh. And there's a large bruise and it finally reabsorbed. And then probably months to years later, he noticed that he had a lump there that never went away. 
And if you can guess now, he has heterotopic ossification. And what's interesting is that he came to present it to me. He said, hey, I have this lateral side knee pain. And when I go and I bend my knee, I feel this like popping sensation. And what was happening is that he had this bump underneath his skin. It was a piece of bone that had grown. It was I, We did an x-ray. It wasn't attached to the femur. And it was floating there, but it was every time he would uh, go in a deep flexion and knee, knee, knee extension, it would literally rub against the underside of his IT band and flop essentially back and forth. And so I went in there to see if it was attached to the femur as well and see what I could do with it. And I'm just literally poking at it and mobilizing it and moving. Now, um, these are just kind of different things that you can do. I decided he didn't want any surgery. I decided to use an 18 gauge. I anesthetized the area and then I used an 18 gauge needle, essentially just like a blunt instrument. And I just shaved it down. Let's see if this video works. Why is this? Okay, it's not working, but you can see the top of it has been sort of shaved off. And I just kind of poked away at it and, and chipped away at it with it almost like an ice pick until um, when he went in a deep knee flexion and extension, he didn't feel it rubbing anymore. Okay, let's, let's move along. So again, so what's this come back to, right? Diagnostic musculoskeletal ultrasound. What's the power of ultrasound regenerative medicine? Well, really it's identifying the pathology and then to accurately place the jectate targeting that specific pathology, right? Okay, so now I'm going to talk about ultrasound sono, sono anatomy. okay? Give me two seconds. I'm going to take a sip of water. I have a tendency to speak very quickly. So let's talk about this. This is what muscle looks like. And muscle it essentially just looks like a black and white steak. You notice this image on the right-hand side. We're looking at the abdominal wall, and you have the external obliques, the internal obliques, and the transverse abdominis muscles, right? And then the peritoneal cavity underneath. And I put up this picture because I just want you to recognize that depending on the orientation of the muscle fibers, if they're running one direction or the other, rather and whether or not they're perpendicular or or, or uh, parallel to your ultrasound probe, uh, it's going to look a little different. But in the grand scheme of things, it essentially looks like a marbled steak. Now, it's important to recognize that the more dark it is, the more muscle tissue you have, and the more white it is, it's likelihood that you have fat, more fatty infiltration, just like a well-marbled steak. Muscle and long axis, it looks like a veins on leaf. This is a gastrocnemius. Um, and these are, I apologize, these are a little bit older images, but this is, um, this, this on top right is an MR of the supraspinatus um, in cross-section. And that is essentially normal, right? This is ultrasound and um, MR of that supraspinatus with a gross atrophy of it, right? So you'll notice in this top right, uh, the dark muscle fibers have been replaced with um, a signal that looks just like the fat tissue surrounding it. And that's because you probably had a tear at some point, um, full thickness tear and it's retracted and it's atrophied and it's turned on the fat, fat. And that's what we call fatty atrophy. And you'll recognize that under ultrasound, you can also identify these things. And so if you're ever considering something, it, you know, you can take an internal control. If you think a muscle has lost its innervation, you can take that ultrasound probe and take a look at it and then compare it to the other side or compare it to their thigh or somewhere else. Um, and so, again, it's the same idea you can see on this piece of steak on the bottom left, how the part that's extra fatty is extra white and the part that still looks like there's some red to it. That's just, it, it's, it's more muscle than it is fat. Okay, let's, let's see, what is this video? Okay, so this, um, this also is a testament to why uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound is very powerful. So about a month ago, I tore, I was on the bench press, incline bench press, and I wasn't going really heavy, but I had probably overworked myself the week before with my friend who likes to go heavy. Shout out to him. His name is Sonny Judah, if you're watching. So uh, I immediately thought, oh, God, you know, I, you know, and it's classic for how you cause this uh, this injury. And I went to the office the next day and I scanned my chest and I saw this and I saw that I had um, I didn't have a tear of the tendon, but I had a tear of one of the bands of the pectoralis muscle and the pectoralis muscle pec major has multiple bands muscle slips. And I saw this. And as I went and I um, moved my arm out, I saw that I had this large collection of out here. There's an intraten uh, intramuscular tendon in here. Um, but that 
unfortunately looked like it had um, moved away. Now, I didn't have any of the other classic sequelae physically. I didn't have a large bruise. I didn't have this deformity. And it's because I didn't rupture the tendon. I did go get an MRI, right? Let's see. Okay, let's move on. Oops. And this is what my MRI said. Hey, no MR evidence of left-sided pectoralis muscle tear. I had all these other issues in my shoulder, but it says, hey, he doesn't have a pec muscle tear. Now, here's the issue with that. There's many issues with this. Number one, um, why does that happen? Okay, have you ever gotten an MRI? What do they tell you to do? They tell you don't move. That's number one. Number two, if you're getting one of the chest, they'll 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 take your arm and they'll have you essentially adduct it as much as you can and hold it up against the body. Now you'll see even when I'm looking at under ultrasound, if I if I adduct my arm, you don't see the tear. And I got the MR within four or five days of this, so it's it's hard to say what it would have looked at if I'd waited. But again, it's missed on MRI. And so that's one of the big advantages of ultrasound is that you have this dynamic, this ability to do dynamic testing. And just so we're, we recognize what had happened, on this right-hand side, you'll notice that um, in the pec, uh, there's um, six slips, muscle slips, off the sternum for the pec major, and there's two that come off the, the cl clavicle. And so likelihood, when I was looking at it, I probably tore either one of the ones coming off the clavicle or this top one up here, S1. Um, but it, again, it's not enough. It didn't extend into, um, into the, the tendon itself. Um, but it was obviously enough to cause, it still causes pain. So what do tendons look like? Well, they're hyperechoic. They have these fibular bands. They're less tightly compacted than the ligaments and they're attached to the muscle. And you can, so you can trace the, trace the structure. Um, this is in Achilles. This is what it looks like in uh, long axis. And this is what it looks like when it's not in long, or excuse me, when it's in long axis, but it's edematous. And so when you have pathology, the classic findings are, first of all, you get thickening of that tendon. You have loss of the fibular structure um, and you can develop, you know, tears inside of you, you can get any uh, changes. Um, they've actually studied this and they, and, you know, if I want to say the normal Achilles is, I, I believe it's point, point 0.9. Um, or 0 0.09 millimeters across. And if it's greater than that or greater than 11 or 13, I, I don't really remember it off the top of my head now, but they you can predict with a very high sensitivity and specificity um, that they have the disease without even getting an MRI. So you can do this at point of care ultrasound. It's very simple. Um, most of us that do this, you do based off of just uh, the gestalt of the entire thing, the structure, but you can also look at the contralateral side. Again, when it's abnormal, you have these calcifications eventually, um, you can have turn on the power doppler, you can get neovascularity if you have tears and whatnot. Um, but you can compare again what normal looks like to, to abnormal. And the reality is that if you've seen enough of these, you recognize that they have a certain morphology to them, where as they come off of the distal calcaneus and they come superior, it's going to taper off sort of like a chili pepper as it turns into a myotinous junction, turns into muscle. And if you see at some point, even without this power doppler, if you see at some point where it widens, See, so imagine on the right-hand side, it's distal. On the left-hand side, it's proximal. If you see the morphology where it goes skinny, fat, skinny, then you know that that area is where the tendinopathy is because the morphology should not look like that. And you can measure this and uh, compare that to, no to normals. And, um, and here's an image of what that might look like. So again, this person's is you know less than half a centimeter on one side, and this side is obviously grossly abnormal. Um, and it's got all these little tears in it. It's lost that fibular structure, et cetera. Okay. Now, um, someone asked me to throw in some stuff on perineal tendons. Um, and so this was one patient of mine that had some perineal uh, tendinopathy. We were, she actually rolled her um, ankles on both sides. She had um, some ankle instability. And I think the perineal tendons were kind of trying to compensate. You'll notice... Let's look at these on the right-hand side. So you'll notice um, this is the perineal brevis, and you'll notice half of this looks dark. And that's not anisotropy because I'm, I'm essentially perpendicular to them, right? I'm perpendicular to them. And so you notice that half of this is gone or it's got loss of that net normal structure to it. And the pronus longus is large and is edematous. It almost looks like shape of an avocado, and it has these tears running through it as well. It doesn't have that normal um, look to it. And these are side to side. They both sides had issues, had a little bit of fluid in them as well. But definitely the one that was more symptomatic was here. 
We'll quickly talk about ligaments. Ligaments are uh, dense fibrous bands and they attach bone to bone. And they're typically going to be injured during an overstretch at the end range of motion for that joint. And so it's hyperechoic. Their fibula, again, um, they, you know, they talk about this linear, tightly clustered bands. And in short axis, they'll stay, uh, it's like end of a broomstick. It's not difficult to figure out which ones are ligaments because they don't never turn into muscle. Um, and so if you trace them back and forth, they don't turn into muscle. And they're also attached to bones and thus meaning a lot of times they're very tightly adhered to the bone. Again, this is uh, a knee and there's um, the MCL again. Okay. Here's an MRI for comparison, just so you recognize what this means, right? So this is an ACL. These are deep structures. We really cannot identify these well with ultrasound. But you notice, again, you have this tight fibular pattern, right? And when it's fully blown, you lose that, okay? So it's the same idea or it doesn't matter the imaging modality we use. It's the same concepts. This is bone. It's hyperchoic. You can't see beyond it. When it's normal, it has a smooth contour. When it's abnormal, you have osteophytes and chips and you have a ragged edge. So this is a posterior aspect to the shoulder. Here's the glenoid. Here's the uh, portion of the posterior labrum. And this is the humeral head. You'll notice there's a humeral head and this antichoic structure here, this black line right here. That is the cartilage overlying it. We have the infraspinous here. And we have the posterior trapezius on top. Or the, the uh, not posterior, but we have the trapezius on top. Um, and so, again, nice and smooth. It should be like a bowling ball. You can identify cor corticoid disruptions. You can, you can, I've picked up uh, fractures with ultrasound that were completely missed on, on um, uh, x-ray. And it's important to recognize that because you have to imagine an ultrasound is super, superly magnified. The magnification is high. The resolution is, is phenomenal. I tell people looking, um, using x-ray sometimes because it's good for gross morphology, but it's not necessarily good for little tiny details. Sort of like looking at the moon with a telescope you got from the toy store, right? You kind of see the moon, you see the general shape of it, and you might see that's got a few dark areas and craters. But to really see the surface of the moon, you're going to need something a lot more sophisticated than that, much better resolution. And that's where things can be missed under all, uh, uh, radiography, plain film radiography, um, that you can pick up under uh, ultrasound quite easily. So we did talk briefly about what it means to have um, what the cartilage is like. If you look on this left hand side, this is essentially is like the distal end of your femur. I, I believe this picture actually might be a chicken chicken bone, but either way, you see this pearly iridescent cartilage sitting on top of the distal um, end of the bone. And we can see this under ultrasound very easily as well. So when you look at this, you see that you have this anticoic cartilage sitting on top of that. And you can see that it's eroded away. And in a lot of people, you'll start to develop osteophytes, like such as this. And the point of me saying this, again, is it comes back to that early, early slide I mentioned, is that you can develop changes that are painful, but aren't going to show up on that plain film x-ray. And so we can screen for um, arthritis that will show up under ultrasound in the office. Number one, it takes probably 60 seconds, um, even faster than sending someone down the hall for uh, an x-ray. But also, we can screen it and identify things that don't hurt yet and might not even fully manifest for a matter of, uh, of years or if not decades. So just beating this dead horse, that's what the cartilage looks like. Now, here's one case that I do want to throw out there. So, you know, I saw this runner, and you've seen this image now 10 times. So hopefully you guys are identifying. This is the medial knee. Here's the meniscus again. Here's the MCL sitting on top. And he was a pain physician, sports medicine guy, one of these granola-eating guys from Denver. Um, and he would say, hey, you know, George, uh, can you take a look at my knee? When I run and at like mile 20 or 30, I start to get this pain in, my, in the side of my knee. Got an MRI and he said, they said it was, there's nothing there. And, he, you know, I said, well, put a finger on where it hurts. He put a finger on where it hurts. And then I put my probe directly over. It. And what did I find? I found this. And I said, hey, that the, there's the money. And it looks literally like a dollar sign, right? And the thing is that if you think about the resolution of even MR, even if you have a 3T MR, your cuts might be one millimeter or 1.5 millimeter thick. And depending on the orientation of your cuts, you may miss something like this. Think about how thin the MCL is on MRI, okay? And so I could put my finger directly on it and I could see it. And he had a tear um, in the ligaments that were from extending from his menisci to his tibia. 
And so again, very quick, you know, we can make diagnoses that are going to be missed on a lot of other types of routine imaging. Very quickly, I'm going to talk about nerves. Uh, this is a patient of mine that I just saw yesterday. Um, and this, uh, she had underwent carpal tunnel release, I think 15 years prior, continue to have symptoms. Uh, they offered her nothing else. And when you do, uh, you can measure what's called the cross-sectional area of a nerve. And uh, there's standards for this. But um, at the carpal tunnel inlet, which is the proximal row of the carpal bones, it's supposed to be less than, say, 0.12 centimeters squared. And you can see on this patient here, it's uh, lost its fascicles. It's lost its uh, epinesium, uh, the, the surrounding hyperchoic epinesium surrounding each of these little fascicles within the nerve. But when I look at the gross cross-section area, it's 0.25. And so she underwent uh, carpal tunnel release, but she still persisted to have symptoms. Um, let's take a look at this one on the right. Also Demetis, and you'll see that's my, my hand, I'm pointing at it, and this is a bifid uh, median nerve. And so that in itself is a um, risk factor for having carpal tunnel syndrome. You can also have a trifid. I've seen a trifid one time. There's me doing an injection around it. Um, and I've also seen it where they have a persistent artery that runs between the two heads. This is a snapping ulnar nerve. Also a patient who uh, had surgery on one side and uh, was symptomatic and had it on both sides. So when he would go from uh, elbow flexion to extension, this ulnar nerve would slap around um, the, the condyle. So just some different things that we can do. The, the, for those who are do, you know, big spine interventionalists, this is um, what looking for cervical medial branches and doing cervical facet work is looks like on an ultrasound. Um, and you can actually see what the medial branches that you've been targeting all this time really look like. And so, you know, they're not just imaginary. Um, I do a lot of uh, ultrasound guided cervical injections and I, I like them for my prolotherapy and my, my regenerative medicine interventions. Now, this is a posterior on the left is posterior and the right is anterior. And what you're going to see here is that a couple of things, um, there's my needle and you'll see injection injectate flowing directly into the joint. The other thing that you'll recognize here is that what's happened is that because it's so arthritic, the two ends of the facet essentially look sort of like two cupped hands or almost like a lobster claw. But from a posterior to anterior approach, I can get into that. Um, I can easily get into the capsule and do an injection. In fact, it's much faster even doing it this way than even under fluoroscopy. I could do three, four levels in probably two minutes. Um, very safe because you can avoid all the sensitive structures. You can see the ascending arteries on this right side over here um, in the anterior uh uh, all, essentially everything you want, you don't want to hit is, is in the tier on the right-hand side. Okay. I'm almost actually almost done. So I, I, I know I've been drawing around for about 30, 40 minutes already. Um, someone asked about bone marrow and this was a case that we just did like two weeks ago or three weeks ago. I got hired to go down to my good friend, Malik Bellani's, uh, practice in uh, Florida, Tampa, Florida. And, um, he had me perform bone marrow aspiration on him. And normally I do this under fluoroscopic guidance. And I, there are people out there that um, do this strictly under ultrasound guidance. And we'll briefly discuss the pros and cons of either one of them. But I, I like the floral guidance way. Um, I think it gives me a little bit more um, margin for, for safety. Um, but this essentially is the posterior elac crest. And what we're trying to do is that we're trying to line it up so that you have a... Um, a broad landing pad, if you will, of bone that you can land onto. And so this is, you know, the anterior table essentially of the elac crest, this is the posterior. And so we we orient the uh, x-ray beam such that we have a nice landing spot uh, where the bone is going to be thickest and more robust. Now, it's very difficult to do that. This is the PSIS here. It's very going to be very difficult to perform that under uh, ultrasound guidance. Some people, it might be possible, but you know, you don't really see due to the anechoic shadow here, really where the bone ends and stops. And so you're kind of, it's a little bit of a guesstimation. And so um, how do we do this? We can uh, square off the top of the sacrum and we oblique, uh, we do a contralateral oblique to the orientation that we want to go into. Um, and we line up the anterior and posterior aspects of the elect crest so that um, the walls look thickest and they're superimposed and ignore you know, the other lines in there. This is a jam sheeting needle. You will anesthetize uh, down to the bone, uh, give it a healthy amount of probably 2% lidocaine. 
Um, Boutique is fine too, but it's probably unnecessary. Um, and you can use a hammer or a drill, or you can use the back of your hand, just depending on uh, what you have av available to you and um, just get it past the cortex. Now, we used to do this as a demonstration from, I don't know, probably seven, eight years ago, we're doing live demonstration during uh, a course. And we used to use a 60 milliliter syringe and that's sort of been debunked. Um, that the idea is that when you use a smaller syringe um, and high aspiration velocity, you're going to get higher CFUs. That was uh, work out of uh, Paris by a uh, ortho famous orthopedic surgeon by the name of Phil Hernigou. Um, now, the point of this is, and I probably should have showed this slide earlier. This is uh, out of um, a book chapter that Dr. Centeno put together. And here's the cross section of this. And you'll see this on a lot of, um, and you can actually pick this up on MRI and also CT images. But here's the point. The PSIS is out here and the bone is only thick for so far, okay? And so I like this approach because it allows me to get into the bone. Um, if I slip out on this side, I'm in the glute muscles. Obviously I don't wanna slip out medially because you're gonna, there's a whole lot of other structures in there, the, the iliac arteries. Uh, femoral nerves, etc. Um, but essentially, if I get nice purchase here, I can advance and I have a, a I have safety margin of being able to advance a certain amount. Now, I don't want to go too far, even if you review the imaging beforehand and have an idea of where the um, either crest gets thin, you don't really want to advance too far. And so in general, you know, you might advance uh, just, you know, maybe two to three centimeters, but it gives you a, an ability to advance it and have different areas to sample from. The other thing about that is that because depending on how much bone marrow you're trying to aspirate, it um, reduces, it allows you to sample more areas without necessarily having to create more holes. Now, this is out of Dr. Furman's book. This is showing under ultrasound guidance an approach to do this where they're coming from a lateral to medial approach through the gluteus muscles. And again, you can identify all this based off of palpation and then you can map it out under ultrasound. Um, but again, you want to aim for the top portion of it where it's thick, but you also want to be able to, um, you know, you recognize that you can't get as far as you might want to, right? You can get, you know, you can get in past the cortex. You might be able to aspirate a little bit. You might be able to advance a little bit, but at some point, very quick, you're going to hit the other end of the bone. And so just be cautious of that. So when people are doing it under ultrasound in this perpendicular approach, they're typically going to sample multiple sites. Um, and I try to avoid that if I can. So anyways, it's a long talk. It's 45 minutes into it. Here's my summary, right? I think ultrasound provides a convenient and cost-effective modality to diagnose and treat musculoskeletal injuries. I think there's a numerous advantages over fluoroscopy, including real-time image guidance, lack of needle, uh, lack of need of contrast and firm needle placement. The problem with it is that the learning curve is very steep and it takes a lot of experience to recognize normal um, and see enough normals um, that the abnormal is poking in the eye. But what's important about this in regards to your musculoskeletal practice is that uh, since most of the evidence base is really in treating soft tissues, I think it's absolutely imperative to have these skills for a successful um, regenerative medicine practice. Um, shout out to myself. Uh, I do offer hands-on uh, training. We do small group courses, live patient demonstrations in Los Angeles in my office, or I can even come to you. Shout out to other couple of people. Thank you to Apex Biologics um, for uh, supporting me all these years and for uh, making excellent products. Um, here's a shout out for this meeting, the 12th annual, actually, I think it's, yeah, the 12th annual New York, New Jersey Pain Medicine Symposium uh, run by my good friend and mentor, Dr. Sudhir Dewan. If you're not a member of WIP, the World Institute of Pain, uh, take a look. There's fantastic. You're going to learn how to do things from different people all over the world and figure out that not everything that you do is probably the best way of doing it. Um, there's a meeting in Dubai, ISPN. Take a look. That's Rita Tolba. He's a friend of mine. He runs that. The LAPS meeting, the second annual LAPS meeting, isn't going to be in Mexico City in September. And then also thank you so much to RGS Healthcare and uh, Rudy Garay for supporting me all these years. Um, that is me. If you want to find me on the internet, my in, my uh, Instagram is regenmeddoctor and uh, my website is gccinstitute.org. Thank you guys so much for your time. I know it's a lot of time. If anybody has questions, feel free to shoot out. 
Well, we got a few for you here, Dr. Chen Chang, and, and you kind of, the first one, you kind of just answered a little bit about what courses do you recommend on ultrasound guided injections? I know you threw a couple up there, but um, those are upcoming. Are there some staples that that you really like? I mean, yours are great, and I think they can always find yours um, on through your website, through Instagram. Yeah. But um, what are there some other ones that you recommend? There are there there are a lot. Um, you know, I think uh, the World Institute of Pain, which I threw up there, um, does uh, phenomenal courses. They have really really good instructors. Literally, some of the best um, physicians from all the world. And their next North America meeting is in uh, Orlando in April of next year. I, I would highly recommend it. The lectures are all online, so you don't go there just to listen to them and talk. It's completely hands on. Um, pretty much as soon as you land. Um, so that's one option. WAPMU is fantastic. Um, uh, and some of these other meetings that we're doing, you know, we'll, we'll do an uh, ultrasound session in New, the New York, New Jersey meeting in uh, New York as well. All right. And I know we've got, a, there's a lot of people just getting in, a lot of people getting into regenerative medicine and they got a few questions. And, you know, I know one is, you know, orthopedic surgeons sometimes see this as voodoo, you know, regenerative medicine. And, you know, what advice do you have for those out there that are doing PRP, like into a joint or bursa, um, and, you know, their orthopedic surgeon is saying it's not going to get any better. You know, they're, they're fighting that from their surgeon. Uh, you know, what advice do you have for them? Sure. Uh, so, you know, a, a lot of my friends are surgeons, and I know that, you know, they're trained with, uh, with this belief that a chance to cut is a chance to heal, right? And, and we kind of say that tongue in cheek. Um. I think that there's enough evidence out there. You know, if you really look at prospective randomized control trials, right? And a lot of these trials aren't done by non-orthopedic surgeons. I mean, Brian Cole out of Rush is, you know, he's the doctor for Michael Jordan, right? I mean, we're talking about big shot, big time orthopedic surgeons who have looked at this and, and done this research. The research, when people say there's no data out there, they I can tell you 99% of the time they haven't looked. And so, you know, if you go in a PubMed, right, and you type in platelet-rich plasma or for rotator cuff tear or, or for knee, knee OFA, you will get thousands of hits on PRP um, as far as, let's say, prospective randomized control trials done a big shot in universities people might have heard of, like Harvard's and the Brigham's and all that. You'll see that there's there's a good number of them. And so I think you, you it's just hard to change um, the, the thought process behind this. Um, and and not to sound, uh, not to offend anyone, but you're, you're also, uh, you're also telling them what they're doing is wrong. And so, so I think, I think the point is that, you know, we're all trying to figure out how we can help these patients and if we can help them in a way that can postpone surgery, you know, I think that's, that should be a, a very worthwhile goal. I agree with you. And, you know, the advances of metal and poly and, in cobalt chrome and, all the different heads and everything. I mean, that's advancing really slowly. And, you know, mm -hmm. that was, that's excelled from the eighties till now. And and I agree with you. I mean, regenerative medicine now um, is an opportunity for, for people to, to start to get their life back. And there's no, you know, in doing it, you're not changing anything. You're not cutting bone. You're not, you know, there's, there's no downside to giving it a shot. And that's one thing that always, for me to always, you know, tell your patients is there's really no downside. Completely. Uh, yeah, we have a couple more, you know, when you're doing a knee injection, you know, do you differentiate from the intraarticular space or isolate the medial or lateral menisci for targeting? So how do you, how do you target? So, you know, a lot of that's going to come down to the physical exam. And so that's what I was saying earlier is that um, you, you have to, you know, the, the idea of a joint and, you know, a knee injection, you know, for knee pain is really, really crude. And, you know, I remember when I was, uh, when I was in training, I won't even say where, when that happened, but I was in training and my, my mentors where I was training, they really had only one shoulder injection. And so, you know, I was in with the patient. I said, you know, I think, I think, you know, this guy's got a rotator cuff tear and we, and I, and we ordered an MRI and the MRI came back and it says he's a rotator cuff tear, but it said the rest of the joint was absolutely pristine. And he said, what do you want to do? And I said, um, well, thing is that I know that like local aesthetics and, and steroids are really bad for this person's rotator cuff. It's toxic to the, to the tendons and the tenocytes. Um, 
But I said, well, I can do a subcutaneous bursa injection. He didn't know how to do that. They they had a one trick for everybody who had a had a, a shoulder pain. It was to go intraarticular. And so, anyways, that's, I'm not trying to make myself sound special. What I'm saying though is that you you have to move beyond that, right? Yes, we can target the medial meniscus. We can target the lateral meniscus, and it's going to be based off of the physical exam and the MRI findings or the ultrasound findings and all the above to help guide your therapy. Again, if you want to charge cash for something. If you do not have good results, you will not do well in this business. And if you have one intervention for everything that comes in your door in this exact same intervention, there's a reason why your outcomes are going to be very poor. Agreed. And there's a couple of different questions here, so I'll just kind of preface it this way. Um, do you always start with PRP? And, you know, I know that's not always the case, but when when would you start with BMC? Or, you know, how do you treat PRP, BMC? Like, when do you use the two differently? How do I use PRP versus BMC? You know, um, I, that's, that's a really good question. And part of that is philosophically, to be frank with you. Um, I, I give everybody the opportunity to have PRP first. Um, and there's a couple of reasons. One, I want to know if they're going to respond to this therapy, this type of therapy, um two it's very minimally invasive right it's just a blood draw and it takes a few minutes to, to process it and um and the economics of it the to, to go through bone marrow um not that it's that much more but it is a significant more investment on both myself and the patient um the cost uh the, the cost climb because of all those things involved and the cost of the kit etc and I and the thing that I don't want to do personally is for them to get bone marrow and then still feel like they didn't respond. And then I have to have some awkward conversations with them. Um, now, I do know some people will in their practice, they'll start off with bone marrow and they say, you know, I think this is the best. And if you don't want to waste time, let's just go straight to it. And so I can't fault them for that. There's I don't think that there's enough data to say one thing or another. Um, I think, to be frank, with the audience, I think more important again, and this is harping back to what I've been saying, but harping back is that I really think it's really important to get that needle into the right place as opposed to necessarily what you're injecting. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, from, from what I've seen in the literature, you know, tendon injections tend to be more PRP based where you're not going to go right to the BMC and you'll, you'll go PRP. And, yeah. and obviously there's, you know, there's kind of, in the industry now, you've got, you know, the talk of A2M or IRAP and things like that. And so, you know, you can always, you've got your, you know, you've got your Toyota, you've got your, um, your Mercedes, and you've got your Ferrari when you're looking at PRP, and then you've got protein concentrate, and you've got um, BMC. And I'm wondering, you know, for you, um, with PRP, you've got PRP and protein concentrate. When do you, would you differentiate between the two since they're both just the blood drawing, but obviously you, you get a little more bang uh, out of the protein concentrate? That's a really good question. And the protein concentrate is really, um, it's a very, it's budding. It's, it's growing in evidence. Um, they, let me preface that. They did a study where they looked at, you know, people like to talk about A2M and alpha-2 macroglobin, uh, which I believe is a heat shock protein. Um, but either way, it's a protein that sequesters um, uh, catabolic substances, right? It, it, it sequesters, meaning it binds up like IL-1, which is potent inflammatory cytokine. It binds up uh, proteases, right? Ma uh, matrix metalloproteinases, and it binds those up. And essentially, I, I think of it as a, uh, when people truly talk about, you know, what's inflammatory and what's anti-inflammatory, I like to think of that as being something that's truly, actually, functionally, biochemically, anti-inflammatory they have shown though there's a study there's a, a like a like a laboratory study that showed that when they even when they moved pulled that out and they pulled they put other things inside the proteins inside the serum into um into a plate of like injured chondrocytes that there was biological activity there and so we haven't actually identified everything that's even in the serum itself um that's going on that's helping so what are, what, it's a long way of saying, you know, do I think A2M or excuse me, protein concentrate is helpful? Absolutely. 
I have uh, people who will go for a marathon run and they're trying to protect their knees so that they can run into their 60s, 70s, and 80s. And if they don't normally have a ton of knee pain, like they don't have an MCL or, or a meniscus issue that I'm trying to target with leukocyte rich PRP, and they just, hey, you know, two days ago I did the LA marathon and um, I'm going to be aching sore afterwards, or they're planned for it actually. Um, I'll have them come back, you know, a couple of days after their marathon, drop the blood, process it, and put protein concentrate into their knee joint, sort of as a preventive therapy to help them um, calm down that knee and, and uh, help them, you know, maintain knee function, if you will, cartilage health, uh, to help extend the lifeline, lifetime of their knees um, as they progress in age. I would agree. And I always uh, put a warning out there to make sure you know, um, if you're using a protein concentrate, which one you're using, you want to make sure that you've got a really good filter out there um, Absolutely. that keeps the strong proteins in and doesn't filter them out. Um, last question, I'll try to kind of put the two together um, because it's a little bit about rotator cuffs. Uh, I heard you talking about a little bit earlier and I'll, I'll kind of make it a two part because one is talking about fraying and, uh, and partial thickness tears versus full thickness and versus retraction. And, you know, which do you treat with regenerative or which would you send on to the, to the OR and, and second kind of part, sorry to throw two at you, but when you approach rotator cuff, you know, how do you isolate the four main tendons that are there? Um, so, okay. Let me answer the second part of that question first. So how do you isolate the four main tendons? So you have to know the anatomy of the tendons. Um, and so it's not difficult to see where the supraspinase is based off its insertion on the superior tubercle or the superior facet. It's not hard to find the infraspinase and follow it out. Now they do have, they do have a conjoint tendon where um, they'll combine and fuse at some point, um, but that's not too hard. The subscapularis inserts on the other side um, and the teres minor inserts on the um, inferior facet. And so that's not that hard. The, the other reality is that the two main tendons that are going to get injured um, early on are going to be your supraspinase, your infraspinase. By the time you have subscapularis injury, like if I evaluate someone's biceps tendon as part of my routine shoulder exam, and I see that the anterior portion of the shoulder, the subscap is already torn, I, with a high level of predictability, um, I can tell you that this person already has four tendon disease in the rotator cuff because that one is protected by PEC. Look at this guy here, my good friend, Joe Herrera, right on this right side in the incredible Filipino Hulk. He's got this big PEC muscle sitting on top. You have to imagine subscap actually has very similar functions. It internally rotates the shoulder, um, and uh, you can put, you can press on it, essentially. You can do presses. It does similar things to the pec, and pec is protecting it. If you're having tear of, of the subscap early on um, in my exam, it tells me that you have, you don't just have micro instability of your rotator cuff, you already have gross instability. Now, the, the question earlier was, if you have fraying of your rotator cuff, right? If you go see a... Part of all this is understanding how these are managed by orthopedics, sports medicine um, in the first place. What are you supposed to do, right? So if someone has a young guy like Joe um, injures himself doing lateral raises in the gym and he comes in and you notice there's two band-aids on his shoulder. I actually did treat his rotator cuff just about two, three weeks ago. And you have a little bit of tear, right? So maybe a 25% tear on the articular surface, meaning the undersurface, the deeper fibers of the supraspinatus. A surgeon isn't going to cut that apart to reattach it. It's really a non-surgical intervention, uh, excuse me, non-surgical management. So you don't, there's none of that going on there anyway. If he goes and he has an abrupt full thickness tear, um, there's no amount of PRP or bone marrow or, or magic glue that's going to make those two ends approximate. And so that's, especially in a young um, active individual, that's a surgical intervention. You should send them to ortho and, um, Ideally, within a week or two, they're going to have um, a double row rotator cuff repair. That's going to give him the best um, uh, the, the best function for his shoulder for the rest of his life. If they have, you know, where they only have one or two fibers left of that rotator cuff, you also, and let me rephrase this. You also have to recognize that the tears can be focal, 
meaning there's there's not just a depth level to it. It's not just how far it is from the bone to the surface, but it's also how large is it anterior, posterior, medial to lateral. And so if it's a focal, focal, small tear, even if it's a full thickness tear, it still doesn't mean there it's a surgical intervention, right? And so those, and anything that's essentially not full ruptured with retraction, I think it's very reasonable for us to go after, um, especially because they, are, they aren't going to be surgical candidates anyways. All right. Well, we've hit our time. And uh, I want to thank everyone for the participation tonight in the webinar. And uh, Dr. Chen Cheng, thank you so much for your expertise in regenerative medicine. Uh, if anyone has any additional questions or comments, you can email info at advanced regen med, regen med institute.com. It's a mouthful. It's a long, we're going to work on that info at re advanced regen med institute.com. All right, everyone have a great night and uh, thanks again. Thank you so much. Take care.